Welcome to Live Streams Online. Thanks for joining us. Particularly want to extend a special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. Hope you enjoy our service today and as you share in the time together, just take a time at the end to reflect on who Jesus is, what he's done, and share in communion together. A couple of things I want to mention today. I want to say thank you to everyone who's taken up the initiative to love our community. This is something that Liz launched a few weeks back about caring for those that are around us. I want to give a big thanks to those who've donated to our Christmas hampers. We'll be sending those out to people in our community over the next two weeks before Christmas. Also want to say a big thank you to the parents who gave chocolates for the community. We've been handing them out to various chaplains, community leaders and businesses in our area. Now our youth also participated in the Angel Tree Project for children in prison this year. Each small group brought gifts for two children. Our Year 7 small group also spent their Smalls Night making meals and hampers for five foster families. I want to make special mention as well of our international friends team. They've done an amazing job this year, organising events like bushwalks, bus trips, cricket games, barbecues and a Christmas party for 50 people. I really want to say a big thank you to all of you who've been involved in organising that and celebrate that this has been fantastic, that you have seen 15 different nationalities of people this year. That's amazing. Fantastic. If you'd like to be involved in that, then please contact Liz. I want to hand over now to John and he's going to share the message for the day with us. Hello everyone, delight to be with you online again and to be sharing with you in our series of He Shall Be Called. And for the last couple of weeks, David and Rod have been sharing on different names of Jesus. I really enjoyed Rod's introduction last week as he talked about his family names, uh, the names they'd chosen for their boys and how they were struggling because they always wanted to, particularly Rod wanted a girl, and he uh, had to choose sons' names because they've got three boys. Well, we were, we were fortunate. We had two girls and then a, a boy. But names are important. And that's why we're looking at this series. Uh, when it came to our own children, uh, we called our first daughter Carissa. Carissa in the Greek is charis, means grace. It means gift, means beloved which is the same meaning of, of my name, of John, a beloved or a loved disciple. And then Angie, our daughter, we called our second daughter, we called um, her because it meant messenger or a messenger of God. And we felt that that was very applicable. Now, you notice that both our girls, poor girls, you know, uh, we didn't give them second names. We felt nobody ever uses a second name and then we repented by the time we came to Josh. And I didn't get my initial wish. We were looking at uh, Bud. And then everybody said, Buddy, you know, it sounds like he's just a friend. It was uh, to be named after a, a missionary. It had a great impact upon us. So we didn't call him Bud. We called uh, Josh, uh, our son Josh. And that means to save. And uh, there was another man who had a lot of influence in my life by the name of Jay. So we called Josh, Josh Jay. Um, Jay uh, means uh, to rejoice, or in Hindi, Hindi it means victory, as I was pointed out by Jay Akama, our friend there. So a lot of fun and a lot of meaning behind these names. And I kind of like the ring that if Josh ever needed to, he could be called JJ. Um, for short. Anyway, uh, that's where we went with names. But the privilege that I have today is speaking about this title that Jesus was given of Son of God. Son of God. And uh, he must die, the religious leaders said, because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now, that's uh, a very, very interesting statement. And before we get to that particular point, I want you to see through the scriptures how Jesus was called this name on a regular basis and by a wide variety of people. And the first of those was when Gabriel came to Mary and she said to Mary, you will call him the son of God. Uh, the angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called 
the Son of God. An incredible statement and quite a prophetic statement because here was uh, Mary who was only engaged. She had not known a man and she was to be overshadowed by the Holy Spirit. Quite a miracle. And then um, the father actually called Jesus the Son of God, called him his son. In Matthew 17 verse 5, we read this, While God was still speaking, a bright cloud covered them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son. Now, if it's God that's speaking, obviously God is calling him his son. That means he's the son of God. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. That's a great encouragement and something that we need to do. And I want to suggest to you that we always need to be listening to the words of Jesus, the Son of God. And then we have that encounter that Peter had with Jesus. And he'd been with Jesus for three years approximately by this stage. He'd seen all of the signs and wonders. And uh, he declared and responded to a question that Jesus asked the disciples, who are people saying and who do you say that I am? And he said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus went on to say, hey, Simon, you didn't just get that answer by yourself. The father's helped you get that understanding because really very few people by this stage accepted that Jesus was the son of God. But it was a great revelation. But then we come into the early church and Paul wanted to establish his credentials as a, an apostle and a servant of God. And in his introduction to the book of Romans, this is what he said. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel that God promised beforehand through his promise in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son. Paul was absolutely convinced as a Pharisee and as a con convert to Christianity that Jesus was God's son. And because of that, needed to be obeyed. And his message needed to be shared. So he laid that as his foundation for his ministry. But now an interesting one. I want to uh, just encourage you to see that even the demons and the devil himself recognised Jesus as the Son of God. Now that's something, isn't it? In Matthew chapter 8, verse 29, this is what we read. What do you want with us? The demons replied and shouted. What do you want with us, son of God? Have you come here to torture us before the appointed time? Because they knew that ultimately the judgment would be their final appointment with God. Um, but even the enemy, even his demons recognised that Jesus was the son of God. Uh, in our deliverance ministry and work, when we're helping people get set free from demonic strongholds, this is one of the scriptures that I've used on a regular basis. You know that we are speaking about the Son of God, about Jesus, and you have no right or claim to this person because there's authority in Jesus' name. But as I began, the religious leaders knew that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And the reality is that Jesus died because of his claim to being the Son of God. So not only did he come in miraculous uh, ways and through his prophesied birth, etc., what we see is that Jesus died because of who he was. Now, this puts another slant and another picture on the life of Jesus, doesn't it? In Matthew 26, 63, 64, when he was before the high priest, it's recorded this way for us. But Jesus remained silent 
And so the high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus responds, you have said so. You have said so. So in John 19, verse 7, it's recorded that the Jewish leaders insisted, we have a law. And according to that law, Jesus must die because he claimed to be the son of God. You can't get it any clearer than that. Jesus didn't refute those claims. Jesus didn't deny those claims. In fact, he acknowledged what they were saying was the truth. And ultimately, that is why he went to the cross. We know that Jesus could have appealed to Caesar. He could have appealed to a higher court. But as he says in John 10 and John 15, he willingly and freely gave his life as a ransom for our sin, as a ransom to redeem us and to set us free. So this actually leads us then to ask a question, I think. And that question is simply this. Why did Jesus, the Son of God, come? In Philippians 2, verses 5 to 8, there are a number of scriptures and statements that are made about Jesus by Paul. He said, Jesus, the Son of God, who being in the very nature God, did not consider his equality with God something to be grasped or to be hung on to. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, our sin separates us from God, from a holy God. And the only way that we could become acceptable, the only way that we could be released from our sin is for us to have somebody come and rescue us. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, we read, God made him, Jesus, the Son of God, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him, not in our own goodness, but in him, in what he has done for us, we might become acceptable to God, righteous before God. Or in Matthew 20, verse 28, just as Jesus, the Son of God, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This word ransom is a very key word. The word actually means that it is the price. A ransom is the price paid to purchase someone's freedom. Interesting, isn't it? Paul, writing to young Timothy as a pastor, said this to him, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, one who could go between God and mankind. The man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This Christmas season, we've got to be grateful for God coming into the world as a man in the person of his son, Jesus. Jesus, the son of God. So in summary, let me just say a couple of things. God the Father, the angel. Simon Peter, the Apostle Paul, even the demons and those that had him killed acknowledged Jesus as the Son of God. And ultimately Jesus died because he declared himself to be God's Son. He died in actual fact for who he was, not for any wrongdoing. And although Adam, angels, Israel, peacemakers and Christians are all called sons of God, 
The scripture designates Jesus as the unique and one and only begotten or son of God. He possesses the same nature as the father, as God. And his unique purpose was to come into the world as a ransom for our sin. In 1193, the English king Richard I, also known as Richard the Lionheart, was returning from re uh, leading a crusade in the Holy Land. As he returned through Europe, Leopold V captured him in Austria, of all places. The Holy Roman Emperor, as he was called, demanded a ransom for Richard's release. The price was to be 150,000 marks, equal to three tons of silver. This was an enormous ransom demand. But you know, the people of England rallied. They so loved their king, they submitted to extra taxation and many nobles donated their fortunes for Richard's release. And after many months, the money was raised and King Richard returned to England. Incredible, isn't it? That's where we get the expression, the king's or a king's ransom. That's where it came from. But to us, the term a king's ransom could better be applied to the tremendous price that Jesus, the Son of God, paid for our sins. As he died on the cross, he died for you, he died for me. And this king wasn't being ransomed. Rather, he personally paid the ransom. He didn't have his subjects pay the price. He paid the price for us. And I want to uh, encourage you to see that because Jesus paid the ransom for us, that is why we can sit, be set free and we can receive the power of the Holy Spirit who will come to live within us and give us the strength and the capacity to live the kind of life that God originally intended. It's the most important, expensive and necessary ransom in the history of mankind and we should be grateful. My encouragement is to accept him today. Let's pray, shall we? Father, I want to thank you today that we have seen Jesus not only was called the Son of God, but he was the Son of God. And that because he acknowledged that's who he was, he died on our behalf. He became a ransom, a ransom to set us free. His life was the ransom. And so today, Lord, I thank you for the men and women and young people who in this quiet moment would say, Jesus, thank you for coming and for paying the price. Please forgive me and please be my Lord, my Saviour. Help me acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God and that he loved me and gave himself for me. Lord, I ask now that by your spirit you'd minister to each one of us and that you'd help us this Christmas to be grateful for what Jesus has done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks for your message, John, and thanks for joining us online today. Look, if you'd like to give today towards our tithes, everything that's given goes towards our mission of helping people find and follow Jesus. And don't forget our Beyond family those who work in other areas of the nation or internationally, helping people find and follow Jesus. I want to remind you again that we have our Christmas Eve services running. 
on 6 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. on the 24th, obviously on Christmas Eve. So it'd be fantastic if you could come on down here and join us. If you can't do that, or if you feel you'd like to watch online, then we will have an online service released at 6 p.m. on the 24th. I hope you can join us one way or the other to celebrate Christmas. Have a great day.